Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce to you Zeynep Tufeci, who's a Berkman uh, faculty associate. She's kind of a rock star in our uh, universe. We're delighted. Uh, well, that happens to the best. <laughs> We're delighted to have you here today. Um, Zeynep is a professor at uh, the University of North Carolina, where she teaches at the School of Information and Library Science but also at the sociology department. Um, she's combining many different disciplines in one person. Um, she's a computer programmer, she's a technology expert, she's an ethnographer, she's a sociologist, and brings that all together in her amazing work. Uh, she studies how technology is actually shaping society uh, and drives social change. Uh, she's a, a, a wonderful writer. I uh, encourage you, if you... Uh, don't already do, to follow her op-eds in the New York Times, which are a must read. Uh, and today she's here uh, to present her new book, which is just out, Twitter and Tear Gas, The Power and Fragility of Network Protest. Unfortunately, we don't have enough copy here. It's the only one, but please order it. It's available. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, Zeynep, we're, we're so delighted to have you here and uh, to host this first uh, Cambridge book talk, right? Thank you. It is. It is. This is my very first book talk. Oh, wow. Uh, I am so thrilled. I am, I, now, I really apologize. I went to the other building. I'm like, I guess nobody wants to hear. I'll just sit here. Maybe somebody will show up. And then I was rescued by saying, I was saying, what are you doing here? I said, proving that having a PhD means nothing when <laughs> it comes to practical stuff. Um, so my... Um, so how, do we, how should we allocate the question and answer time so I time myself correctly now that I'm a little late? Well, you can speak for 20 minutes and then one. Okay. okay. So, we, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a brief, I guess, overview. I won't go over everything, uh, but I'll try to explain and then I'll try to draw it out in the question and answer part because I think that will be much more uh, productive. And what I'm trying to puzzle through here is what is this new pu network public sphere that we're all talking about evolving into? And I'm getting at this from the point of view of social movements. But to get from the point of view of social movements, you have to sort of discuss all the other dynamics that are emergent and that are becoming more and more um, solidified. <coughs> so just very briefly to situate myself, I'm originally from Turkey. I grew up there. Uh, I grew up without the internet. I grew up without access to enough books. Um, I used to have practically every single translated encyclopedia in Turkish because that was a very finite amount. And, I, and my grandmother would buy them for me, so I had every one of them. I would just reread them. So I grew up in a situation where you'd run out of things to read, and there was heavy censorship. You had one TV channel, and they'd. Um, They'd show us Little House on the Prairie. It makes so little sense in the Middle East. I, I can't even explain how little sense. We don't, <laughs> we don't have a frontier. Like, you dig, and there's like four civilizations and ten empires. What is this middle of nowhere they're allegedly in? Right? Made, <laughs> uh, but the reason we got that channel and that TV show was because it was after a military coup, which had uh, established very strict controls over the public sphere which lasted, in some ways, reverberating to this day. Uh, and there was a big conflict in the Kurdish Southeast that, of course, we didn't hear about. And then, I, because I was a programmer uh, by profession, I ended up working at IBM early on. And they had a global intranet before anybody in Turkey had internet. So I got a sense of, oh, wait, you know, I'm, it was a bizarre project. We were localizing a MIDI system that was programmed on big mainframes that were built before I was born and I was supposed to work on you know all the levels and sometimes I'd have a question and I'd be asking an IBM's intranet and it would be someone in Japan would say oh boy yeah I, I wrote that here's how you do it I thought this is amazing you know I can't figure out what's going on in my own country but I can talk to someone in Japan who's going to help me right IBM's virtual network so that kind of made me really that experience and thinking about computers made me really interested in how this was going to change everything. And then the internet came to Turkey, and I just jumped on it. And at the time, uh, it was sort of the tailor end of the Zapatista 
a movement that had captured so much global attention. And they were allegedly using the internet a lot. I was really curious. Uh, I emailed people and I showed up at their encuentros. They were holding these encuentros, um, bringing together activists together from around the uh, world. And then I've been sort of following, participating, observing, thinking about these movements since then, which I trace from, like, I, I would trace it from the Zapatistas to the uh, Seattle 99, uh, the WTO protests, to the, uh, the anti-corporate globalization protests of the 90s, kind of. And then 9-11 happened, which changed a lot of things. And there was the anti-war movement. And then we had the latest wave, which is the Occupy, uh, the whole Arab uprisings, and then it's still kind of you have these uh, different countries, Turkey, Isipark protests, uh, Hong Kong, so there's been a lot. If you look numerically too, the number of protests has tripled or quadrupled depending on how you measure. I, I bet if after you put 2017 it's going to be even more. But, so here's the one of the motivating puzzles of the book that uh, we'll get to, that I'm trying to sort of get to with this book is if digital technologies are indeed so empowering in so many ways, right? why are we also seeing authoritarianism on the rise around the world? How does that square with that? And if, especially since the tech world tends to be on the progressive liberal libertarian spectrum, um, so the makers and uh, a lot of the early adopters of these technologies and the creators tend to be on one side of the political spectrum, but the movements, they end up sympathizing around the world. If you look at, you know, you go to Tahrir, lots of open source people there. You know, it's kind of this global thing. So technology competence isn't a problem. But the movements have the cycle of getting very big and then not having the proportional impact you would expect from a movement with that level of energy showing. So I was trying to figure all of this out. So um, just, this is the book. And it's not out yet, so sorry, I don't have <laughs> copies either. I, I guess um, it'll be out. So one of the things, I very quickly, I, I never use the term virtual because digital technologies are pervasive in everything we do. I, online, offline, I don't even find that useful anymore. They're part of social movements because they're part of life. And I think finally that debate may well be over. Uh, but of course, the fact that they're part of life I mean, they're not a separate world, right? They're part of this world. But they do have major impacts on this world. I look at them as one more set of technologies that's altering the space and time as we experience it, right? And this goes back to telegraph. It sort of allows you to talk across distance or writing. It allows you to preserve ephemeral thought over time. So time and space altering technologies, tools, are very integral to our human culture. This is the latest iteration. It's changing the geography of our world in lots of ways. And computation is also bringing, introducing a new kind of intelligence, which isn't really in this book. So that's sort of just this big broad thing. I don't talk virtual or not. This is, my data is very multi-level. This is me in Gezi Park protests. I have a helmet on because tear gas canisters aimed at your head are not good for someone in my profession or anyone else. Um, but I also look at, big data sets. Uh, I also look at other people's scholarship, right? So my book isn't based just on here are my, like I did a lot of systemic, systematic interviews. I've been to, you know, protests in Tahrir and I've been to all the Arab countries that were uh, occupied here. But it, my book isn't just about my own primary research because I wanted to synthesize. I mean, a lot of my research obviously uh, is there, but I wanted to synthesize. And this thing I'm studying, this is, I call this globalization from below, the movements, because you've always had the powerful globalizing. This is a picture I took in Gezi Park protests in, I don't know, day two, day three. Uh, this lady, she's, uh, she's a Roma lady, and uh, they, they, they sell flowers to tourists around Taksim. If you've ever been to Taksim Square, which is sort of the central square, uh, they're selling flowers to tourists, and they're selling souvenirs and knickknacks. So the protests hit, and the whole place, of course, is now like, you know, that, that building, it's not supposed to have all those banners. Like, people just took over and occupied the whole place, and there are clashes. So what happens in two days? They have manufactured 
gave the Guy Fox masks somehow. And they're, instead of selling flowers, they're selling goggles to protect your eyes from tear gas. Uh, in case you're into graffiti, here's your spray paint. And um, like they have sort of anti-tear gas stuff and, and you see these masks. I'm like, this is the leanest production just-in-time thing I've seen. In two days, they've completely shifted inventory. And then I picked these things up and everybody knew what to do, right? The masks, the symbols, they're so globally recognized, even in Turkey. And I'm like, where did you get these masks? And the masks are a little weird. If you've seen them elsewhere, they're like a little off. Then I realized they somehow downloaded a 2D picture from the internet and then somehow tinkered and figured out a 3D model from it. But of course, it's not easy to get the 3D depth exactly right from the 2D picture. So they're a little off. They just somehow, you know, in one day, this is what they could do. So this is amazing to me that there's this global protest culture uh, that is very recognizable with the tear gas and the Guy Fawkes and everybody. It was just um, for, you go a lot of places. Of course, every country is different, right? Every country is different. But as I traveled around, right, when I first saw, and I went to, you know, Egypt, and I'm in Tahrir Square, I'm talking to people, and I'm like, well, okay, so maybe this is Egypt, and Egypt has all these sort of peculiarities. And then you see the um, Indignados movement in Spain, and it's very horizontalist, participatory, and it's Spain, you know, you have a tradition of that. Occupy, and you're like, okay, it's New York, and you sort of see these similarities, and you keep trying to add to the reasons why each one just convergent there. And then I went to Turkey, which never had a leaderless movement <coughs> of size, right? Never had occupations like this. Doesn't have any of the cultural elements you see in Spain or something, a history of anarchist movements, participants or anything. And I found a movement that was really similar. And that's when I started thinking, you know what, it's really a global convergence. I keep explaining each one of them away. Uh, but there is a global pattern here. It doesn't mean there aren't peculiar specific things to each movement. Of course there are, but there's a lot of globalization from below. So, all right, let's get to the boring parts, this analysis. <laughs> pictures over from here on all text. Uh, I'm kidding. There'll be some more pictures. So when, when I look at a movement, right, this is what first, the first thing I'm trying to distangle is the wrong way, I think, to analyze what's happening is to look at the movement repertoires, marches calling a congressperson, uh, demonstrations, occupations, even direct action, right? And compare them to their past counterparts. Why? I think it's misleading because, as I'm going to argue, I think digital technologies have brought really different dynamics. So when you see a march, you're not really looking at the same underlying capacity as before. So if you just compare marches to march and you say, this is a big march, this was a big march. Uh, a big march in 1970 or 60 is not the same creature as a big march in 2017. So to sort of distangle what's what, I, I try to develop this idea that movements have capacities. And I'll go through quickly at electoral narrative institutional capacities. And they also have internal capacities. This will hopefully make sense. And they have these movement repertoires marching that are actually signals of those capacities. So I'm kind of making this, there's a surface epiphenomenon that you're seeing, and it now reflects something different than the past because the process generating it has shifted. And a lot of the analysis tends to look at the surface manifestation and compare them apples to apples kind of situation. But since the process generating them has Significant changes, I am going to argue you can't do this and let's not do that. And also I want to, um, I want to take a few minutes later uh, to theorize attention as its own resource. Now I am greatly helped by the fact that Tim Wu has just come out with a book uh, called uh, Attention Merchants. Um, but until that, basically attention has rarely been theorized, especially in the context of social movements, as a resource itself. Usually it gets conflated into media analysis. In the past that made sense because mass media and public attention were broadly conflatable, conflatable. Whereas right now it's not. So you need to look at attention as its own resource. And that helps explain and understand a lot of things um, there. Okay, so 
Let's look at the narrative capacity. I'm going to um, talk about a Turkey example. Well, people who know anything about the Geza Park protests are snickering because I will explain. So this is CNN International at the height of Turkey's Gezi protests. I mean, I don't need to explain, right? The, this is Taksim Square. This is, this is like Times Square, right? This is a lot of stuff happening. CNN is live. This is CNN Turkey at that exact moment, showing the very, very important documentary on penguins. Because it must, right? The peng now, nothing against penguins. What was happening here uh, is that the CNN Turkey, which these Turkish media companies are owned by large conglomerates who are not interested in media. They're interested in government contracts. It's a way of uh, government pressure. They weren't going to displease the government by showing what might be happening in the biggest square of the biggest city, right? So they show they sort of and they need to fill airtime, so they show the Penguin documentary. Now, as this was happening, though, of course, everybody had, not everybody, but tons of people had their phones. And because of a couple of incidents previously in Turkey, of bombing of a Kurdish village that was first censored and then came out through uh, social media, basically Twitter and Instagram, that got a lot of people thinking, wait, I get news not from TV, but from my phone. This was completely ineffective, right? When I had Little House on the Prairie, I, this, all I had was my Little House on the Prairie. Now you could go to your phone and get this, right? So this was, this, the, the narrative capacity to censor the old way doesn't really work anymore. And I, I'm going to spend the least amount of time in the narrative capacity, but just say every movement you see, they really help change the conversation. You see that power, right? Occupy brought inequality into the conversation. Uh, black Lives Matter, if you look at the statistics, the number of um, shootings of black people by police isn't actually up. It's just we're talking about it now, thanks to a movement, right? If you look at the statistics, this has been this chronic problem, and there's not a spike. There is a movement that has been, that has told us, look at this, right? And you know, so there's more conversation. So the narrative capacity component, like the social media really allows movements to um, intervene in the public sphere and change the conversation. So it got so bad that whenever there's a picture, Turkish Twitter users would put penguins in the middle trying to attract CNN. This is called CNN bait, right? You're like, here, maybe you'll cover it. So <laughs> they, whenever there's something going on, there'd be a bunch of them huddling. Uh, but, you know, it was really great. If you were on, t and it was so, this kind of humor was so ingrained. I mean, when, I mean, when people talk about online, offline, I'm like, what are we talking about? Because in Gezi Park, people would literally go and they, you'd get tear gas, right? It, and it's horrible. But tear gas is one of those things that just, it's not deterrent enough if you get used to it, but it's really annoying. You feel like, you feel horrible. You, the first time you feel like you're going to die, and then you're like, wait, I'm not dead. And then you get really upset because uh, <laughs> you feel like you can't breathe. It's a very existential terror, right? Anyway, so people would get tear gas, and they would go to the back, and now you know, they're kind of experienced, and they know they're not going to um, die. And they'd be like really <coughs> coughing, and they'd immediately pull out their phone. And then you'd see the sort of laughing, coughing, kind of trying to breathe mixed with laughing, because the online humor, the online virality, and the offline stuff, there was really completely integrated. And I talked to so many people there who were super thrilled that they could connect with their phone, they could tell people who were elsewhere what was going on, uh, they could, um, when they were away, they would check what was going on, and there was a lot of coordination, lots of things we'll talk about a little bit. Of course, tear gas in Turkey, uh, a smoking country, yeah, it's a mixed thing. I literally could only breathe well in the park in the minute 6 to 20 of the post-tear gas, because that's only one time the people didn't really smoke a lot. So there's the tear gas, and then five minutes of horrible tear gas, and then a little bit of clearing. And I was like, oxygen, this is great. And then by minute 20, people smoked so much that in open air, I couldn't breathe. So I was joking that I was going to provoke the cops <laughs> to get tear gas so that I could breathe for 10 minutes before they took up smoking. But so the narrative capacity, the penguin became the symbol of Gezi Park protests in lots of ways. More like the censorship, and 
the, I, you know, people were like, the, 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 the Twitter bird was very crucial um, to people's imagination of how you communicate, and the people were just there, the tear gas mask became also a very thing. So let's talk about the disruptive capacity a little bit. <coughs> when I say disruptive capacity, I mean the capacity to stop business as usual. Civil disobedience is a form of disruptive capacity. Um, blocking a road, non-cooperation, Indian independence movement. Um, so there are a lot of these. Occupations are disruptive. Now, in the past, when you try to pull off something disruptive like that, like Seattle 99 kind of situations, there was already cell phones there used to coordinate. And it was the first time the police were like, holy crap, they can also talk to each other. Because they'd go someplace and they'd you know, surround people and then people would be like, all right, they're here and blah, blah, blah. And all the sort of not that kind of phone yet. Uh, and I, I read sort of uh, comments by the police that were like, oh, okay, they can coordinate too. Because until then, the police could coordinate, armies could coordinate, and logistics, you know, the sort of the governments have the resources to bring that kind of logistics. Whereas disruptive capacity is really difficult because you're often going to have um, government forces come at you to remove the disruption. And if they're, you know, much more uh, resourced than you, especially with logistics, then that is a pretty unequal game. So I'm going to talk about an example of how digital technologies have altered some of these capacities from Egypt, this one. And this is, this is Tahir Supplies. This is literally their first tweet. Tahir Supplies was a um, group of youngsters in their 20s. And uh, what happened is in November of 2011, in, um, so Tahir is this very large square. It has tons of big streets coming into it, which is why it's kind of hard for them to control it completely. It's a very big square, and it's got lots of entrances. And one of them, uh, Mahmoud Street, leads directly into the Ministry of Interior. It's the sort of big, imposing building. And I mean, it's a Ministry of Interior in an uh, autocracy followed by a military dictatorship regime. It's as bad a building in terms of what happens as you imagine, right? That it's a symbol of lots of horrible things. Those lots of horrible things happen there. So there are clashes leading up to the Ministry of Interior in November of 2011. The story why that is, is I kind of explained that in my book, why there were clashes going on. It's a part of the story of the movement um, I, I, let me not go into that. Uh, let's just sort of say big clashes. Is, uh, I'll, I'll explain uh, why the clashes are important to disrupt our capacity. A lot of the participants are the young people who are frustrated with where the post-revolution, post-uprising, whatever you want to call it, process is going. And these are not, okay, this is Egypt, so they're not minor clashes. During this uh, period, 30 to 40 people, I believe it's 37, uh, people died. So we're talking about, I mean, this is a large number, right? We are talking about tens of thousands of people. We're talking lots of people being injured. And if you have a situation where thousands of people are there, if you have a number like 37 dead, it means there are thousands injured, right? To get, you know, you can sort of um, extrapolate from that. Now, the way Tahrir protesters deal with um, these sort of injuries is they have field hospitals. In fact, they had about 10 field hospitals that were set up. And the field hospitals first sprung up during the initial January 25, February uh, uprising. And in fact, they have names. Like there's the KFC field hospital. It's in front of the KFC, right by Tahrir Square. Got so bad, the propaganda was like that Americans were behind the protest and they were distributing free KFC, um, which is not very, like, you know, get shot at free KFC. I don't think so. Uh, but it's the East KFC. There's another one in a mosque. There's like, they're in particular places where there's no. Now, if you have thousands of injured people, 
And you have this sort of triage situation. People are coming in from minor injuries to major injuries. How do you organize the supplies? Like this might seem like a minor thing, but if there's any military buffs out there, this is not a minor thing. Uh, organizing supplies in the chaotic conflict situation with a lot of tear gas and live bullets and rubber bullets flying around with lots of injured people, and you are not a state, you are not a government, you, you know, you're just creating, uh, you know, you're using half of a mosque as a hospital. So people were using Twitter to ask and sort of recommend supplies, but it was getting really confusing. Because you've seen it, right? There's a retweet and then somebody says, wait, that was two years ago. Um, or somebody says, you know, we need more betadine in KFC. And turns out 30 people bring them betadine. Now there's too much betadine, right? It's kind of that kind of coordination of resources is not automatic. And Twitter, nor Facebook, nothing is really suited to doing this on the fly. So we're going to come to this. So uh, a pharmacy student who was, I think, all of 21 or 22 at the time, who was not even in Cairo, is going through and saying, this is so confusing. And he's like, let me organize this. Now, I have a lot of stories like this. I have a lot of stories of 20-something people who are like, OK, here's a problem. Let me do this. Uh, luckily, they don't know it's a hard problem ordinarily. <laughs> they just do it. Uh, I have like citizen journalism. One of the biggest citizen journalism networks in Turkey came out like that. A bunch of you know, 20-something saw censorship, and they <laughs> got up one day and said, let's create a citizen journalism network. Five minutes later, they started. So uh, my, uh, this, this person gets up, says, let me organize this. Five minutes later, Twitter feed, test. Okay. So here's what happened. He quickly found three more people, only one of them in Cairo. One in London, actually, which helped, right? You know, Gulf, Cairo, London, different time zones. So four people. None of them are Twitter stars. And, you know, they're just in a couple hundred followers of their friends, and they follow people. And they quickly put up Google Sheets, you know, spreadsheets. They started pinging people, saying, look, we're going to organize it. And this is ad hocracy, right? People are used to this now. You just go, all right, here you do it, on the fly. And they started pinging some high-profile people on Twitter saying, let us do this, let us do this. At first, you're like, who are you? And then people were like, all right, let's see you do it. You have no idea who these people are, right? This is in the middle of this. And then they started finding the phone numbers of the people on the ground. So they started calling them and saying, look, we're going to do this. If you need something, we're either going to call you, you're going to tweet at us, you're going to DM us, you're going to you know, message us. So slowly by which I mean very fast by historical standards, basically one day, <laughs> they took over the whole supply chain. Right? And not only do they take over the whole supply chain, they have a real-time inventory up on the web down to like how many needles for you know, suturing our wear and what. Everybody's completely supplied. I mean, as these things go, very quickly. And all of a sudden, of course, they have the sort of all the retweets about bring, you know, can you bring more betadine? They all stopped. Everybody immediately adapted. Like you don't even know who these people are, and, and just one of them is in Cairo. They're not on the ground. Um, and then they were able to crowdsource, right? Because they all of a sudden they have this attention, and because of the uh, the, the the way they use tear gas canisters is. Uh, we sell to these countries, they're all made in the US, in my little bug, is that they shoot at you, right? They're supposed to be shot with a 45 degree, you know, sort of a parabola. They shoot right at you. So a lot of eye injuries, and there was apparently something machine you needed to immediately uh, intervene. $40,000, they raised it, right? They're like, let's get some money. So he did all of this. Um, I have like a slide of a field hospital, I believe. Yeah, like these are field hospitals. Um, like they're just, they are doctors and nurses, but you know. So after this thing calmed down, I interview him. Uh, and, and I kind of got to know them because they were tweeting too fast and they got in Twitter jail. Because Twitter's not made for this, right? I mean, Twitter's set to 
talk at South by Southwest and here you're organizing field supplies. So we try to help him get out of there. Um, as I'm interviewing him, and I said, what was your model for, you know, what made you think you could organize all the logistics in the middle of all these clashes? You know, 10 field hospitals. What did you, what was your model? Where'd you get your inspiration? He was like, um, cupcakes? Cupcakes? <laughs> I, I'm like, all right, okay, you haven't slept in many days, it's okay, <laughs> we'll talk later. He's like, no, 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 there's a cupcake store in Cairo uh, that was using sort of viral promotions to sell whatever cupcakes it had in Morocco. So he was inspired by the social media success of a cupcake store in Cairo. And I'm like, did you hear anything about Napoleon Moscow, you know, logistics? He's like, what? <laughs> Said Hitler Moscow. He's like, no. I'm like, do you have any military history, interest, background, logistics, supply? He's like, no. I'm like, that's great. Because you probably would not have tried if you had. He's like, oh, maybe I'll get to reading it. That's nice talking to you. And I said, great. And this is like a lot of my experiences. Like I talk to these young people and I'm really amazed at what they pulled off. And sometimes I say, well, there was this historical thing and they have no idea. And I'm like, all right, shut up, shut up. Just don't tell them because why bring them to the ground in terms of what they can do? Because they can do this. This is, uh, this is, this isn't disempowering at all. Okay, so this one is very straightforward. I'm not going to explain. This is, we're going to come back to this. The third kind of capacity I kind of discuss in my book is the electoral institutional capacity. Do you scare politicians? That's not only done through voting, but voting is one way in this country. Primaries is one way. Raising money is another way. Her, you know, calling them is another way. Do you force institutions to change? So these kinds of like in social movement literature, the insider outsider strategies, we will come back to this, but this is kind of self-explanatory and we'll explain why we're gonna come back to this. Now, let's add one more thing to the technology thing, is that these protests have a very particular political culture. I don't just, I mostly talk about these left anti-authoritarian tech field ones in my book. Obviously, they are not the only kind of protest movements in the world. They're just kind of that. It's a kind that I follow, and it's a kind that has a large global presence. And these movements have globalization from below and political culture kind of converge to a participatory horizontalist model. And to explain this, this is a Gezi Park protest library. Um, and so many of them have libraries, okay? In Hong Kong, they set up a library. Occupy, they set up a library. Now, I love libraries, okay? I, I mean, I, I could just sort of put up a tent in a library and happily live there. Um, but it was always a question to me. Like, it's not the first thing you think of, right? It's not a practical need. They all have clinics, they need them. They all have, just, food, soup kitchen, while well, somebody needs to feed the people. So there's a lot of practical stuff they do, but they all set up libraries. I'm like, so this is a sort of like interesting question. And they all have these colorful things. This is very soon after Gezi Park protests, a pride march near the area. And I mean, you see uh, that this person's on stilts, so this person's wearing the a bunny with a tear gas mask, why not? Like they're kind of these very irreverent protests and they're very colorful. Um, so the library question, what, what's so attractive about libraries? To so understand is you have to sort of think about the political culture uh, that goes back, well you can find other antecedents, but you can sort of see this in the 68 movement too. Like the Port Huron statement that was the 1960s, early 1960s statement by a lot of people, signed by uh, a lot of people that became very prominent in the 68 movement. If you read it and change a few things, they talk about men, make it human, that kind of stuff, because we're not in the 1960s anymore. It reads very similar. It talks about participation, it talks about voice, it talks about feeling disempowered, it's very recognizable to a 2011 protester. With one difference, that kind of protest culture that comes from feeling alienated and disempowered by electoral 
uh, democracies, by what liberal democracies has turned into, the sort of co-optation and corruption of power by governments, corporations, all of those things, alienation, existential questions, uh, wanting to be in that participatory moment where you have a voice. It's all there in the culture, but one difference is if you have that culture and you want to hold big protests, it's harder without the digital technology, right? What I think I observe, which I argue that I observe, is that we see this convergence of a very participatory, ad hocratic, voice participation, horizontalism, uh, with merging with digital tech that allowed you to do things in a new way, but the desire to do things in that new way had been there and bubbling through 60s, 70s, 80s. People wanted to have leaderless movement. It's just as harder. Like if you can't use hashtags to pull a movement together, it's harder to have a leaderless movement because who's going to organize and get the permits and do the things and all of the stuff, right? So the thing, um, the leaderlessness, adhocracy, participation, it found its enactment through the affordances of digital technology. So this is part of the thing I argue. And that's, so here we're getting to sort of finally pulling it all together, is that this is what I've been kind of saying about movements, is that digital technology, internet has kind of started acting like the Sherpa in climbing Everest and a few other big mountains, but mostly Everest, in that it allows movements that have, um, Grievances, as all movements do, legitimacy, desire for participation, it allows them to skip over certain infrastructure organizational capacity building steps to go straight to the street protest, big march, some de you know, big demonstration, some signal of displeasure. But the technology is actually sort of doing what Sherpas do for all the people climbing Everest or not mountaineers, is that it's carrying your stuff for you, right? So in the past, in the past, if you wanted to hold a large march, and this is an example I give, let me sort of show you, like, um, I, I, I'm going to come back to this. If you wanted to, if you sort of go back to, like, did, let me look at all three, I'll come back to this, right? This is 1963. March on Washington, and these are like Gezi Park, Maidan, Tahrir, like Ukraine. Um, so this, they look the same, but this one takes you about 10 years to get even to the place where you can try to hold that big march, 10 years of moon building, and it took them six months to organize it. And it wasn't an easy thing, right? Because 1963, D.C. is not a safe place for a large anti-march march, anti-racist march. They can't even stay in town because it's too dangerous. People are afraid they're going to get attacked, right? So you have to bring all these people in and get them out. This is not a straightforward thing if you don't have Google spreadsheets and Twitter hashtags and all the things that you can do with this. And they had to organize it to the level. Like, they can't trust the hospitals. Of course, you don't want anything. They can't trust anything in the city. So they had to make sure, like, the sandwiches they distributed didn't have mayonnaise, which could spill, right? You had to micromanage the process. It took them six months of intense work uh, to organize this. So when you look at this, like, uh, this, is, this is where I'm, like, this is where we're getting into my theory again, is that if you look at movements as capacities, when you look at this one, when you're in the, from the point of view of power, when you look at a movement, you think, if they could do this, what else can they do? Otherwise, the march doesn't have some magic to it, right? I mean, you march, great, I march my whole life. But if you're in power and you're looking at it, what you're thinking is, if they can march with these numbers, what else can they do? It is not the same with this versus this. I'm not saying marches are a bad thing. I'm just saying it's a different thing. This is the culmination of 10 years of work to just get to be able to do this, whereas these are maybe the beginning of something, which is a problem for movements because you get the most attention without having built um, network internalities. Sorry, blah, blah, slide again. But this is basically, 
if you have to do things the old way, and I'm not going to argue, let's go back to the old way. I'm just saying like this is what happens when you do things the new way, is that you don't build these network internalities, which is a word I made up because uh, I didn't have a word for it, uh, which is like if you're taking care of some level of task, you gain collective decision-making capacity, delegation, uh, you learn how to work together. And it doesn't matter if the task is trying to figure out how to mimeograph leaflets or create a world parliament. It doesn't really matter, right? When you do something together, you build collective decision-making capacity. Current movements, because they're participatory, because they go from zero to 100 miles an hour using the internet as their Sherpa, they do not have the collective decision-making capacity as their process. Uh, and that brings us to why my theory of why they kind of stumble is that they turn, run into a tactical freeze right after their first big protest. And this may happen in the US too, we shall see. Probably not, because lots of learning going on. But this happened in one way or another in lots of movements you watch, is what happens is you're, you don't have sort of this 10 years of collective decision making. You've already got a participatory horizontalist culture that values voice for very understandable reasons. The reason people protest is because they're feeling alienated, right? So you're not going to expect them to be uh, cogs in a machine in such a situation. So I, I'm, I'm not saying any of this in a judgmental way. So you come to this participation, participatory impulse. And then you go from zero to a million people in the street in three days. In Women's March, Facebook posts, million people in the street, a month or two, right? Very little infrastructure. And since voice is so valued, and you're, the, you're operating on platforms like Facebook and Twitter, which don't really allow decision making, they're good for capturing attention, and they're good for uh, outrage, they're good for a bunch of things, but they're not good for decision making at all. So you come to your, you, you went from zero to 100 miles an hour, you haven't really built your car. Like your dry, steering wheel is kind of not even there. And then you have a government come at you. This is almost like the startups. You can be Instagram, you can have like from zero to 100 million users in, I don't know, a year, and you have only 11 engineers. Why well, you get bought by Facebook. If you're, a, if you're a social movement, you don't have any venture capitalists trying to come to rescue. You have a government coming at you. And that requires a tactical shift. And if you look at sort of successful movements, uh, I mean, civil rights movement is not the only movement in the world. It's more, more familiar, so I'll give that example. You see this in the Indian independence movement, too. They shift tactics. And each phase has a particular target and policy and strengths and weaknesses. And then it kind of stops working sometimes, so they shift again. These movements have no decision-making capacity to shift. And because they're on these attention maximizing, capturing uh, platforms, what I see them turning into is this massive internal bickering that is played out publicly. And I don't think it's a coincidence that you see this in almost every country. You see this again and again. You see the sort of phases. This is a Gezi Park, post Gezi Park protest where they're trying to decide what to do. They're holding assembly style decision making where everybody's supposed to speak in a you know, park. It, so obviously, you can't make a decision that way, right? Because it, they couldn't, right? What do you do next? Occupy couldn't do it either. After it was evicted, it couldn't find the next tactical move. Uh, and you see this freeze. The people keep wanting to go back to the first thing. They keep wanting to have a Tahrir Square <coughs> occupation. They keep wanting to have this part situation. And I think this is a sort of dysfunction of collective decision-making capacity, lack thereof. So uh, I'm not going to do the uh, thing, but I, I said that I'm going to, I, because I want to have time for a thing. So what I'm talking about is, if you know the biological signaling theory, right? So um, gazelles sometimes do this thing where they jump up in the middle of, like, even if they're just sort of grazing and then they just jump up. It's actually kind of silly, right? You're wasting energy. Why are you jumping up? It's actually a honest signal of their muscular capacity. You're basically telling. I don't know, whatever eats the tigers, lions, whatever's eating them. Look, I can jump really high. I got good muscles. I'm going to run fast too. 
right? So it's signaling something, even though it's kind of costly. The same thing with the antlers. It's like it takes energy to build them that big. They're kind of silly. Like your head is always looks like that. Why do they have them? Well, they're basically saying, I got lots of nutrition, okay? So this is where I'm going to uh, argue that one of the things that we've done in the past, like Berkman Klein has studied the Sophopipa type of things, I don't think they're going to work anymore because I think they weren't signaling an enormous amount of capacity. They were like Google changes homepage and you could call your Congress people very quickly. It was actually fairly easy to do. Uh, but lawmakers weren't prepared, so they couldn't read the signal and they freaked out. And I think in the past few years, they have learned that the digital technology makes some things easier. So, you know, big marches, they annoy, who, you know who, right? He's really annoyed by them. But it's not really a rational annoyance, he's just very annoyed, so fine with me. Uh, but the legislatures aren't even that scared of your phone calls anymore. Because there's so many tools that have automated it. I, like, I come across it all the time. People are like, here, you know, click here and we'll connect you. Well, I mean, where is the signal if you do that, right? So the question for social, I'm not saying don't call. I'm just saying it's easier for them to ignore the same volume of calls that would have scared the living lights out of them 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, it would have signaled some other kind of capacity, whereas right now, it might be some national email list of people who are not their constituents, who, don't, who are not a primary threat to them, who are not an electoral threat to them, who are just jamming up their switchboard. And I, I, I'm even seeing Congress people tweet like saying, all right, my switchboard is jammed again. People don't use that because they're not changing the way they vote based on volume of phone calls the same way they would anymore. And I think this is also true for marches. They look at it and they assess it. In Hong Kong, the Chinese Communist Party absolutely did not freak out. Lots of people on the street patiently waited out and tried to ignore it rather than sort of fuel it. And that was kind of a strategy that worked. So uh, this is where it all, you know, this is the sort of signaling theory. And I already explained this. So uh, the it's like almost final slide. This is my proposal is like, let's not analyze movements by looking at their outputs. Let's look at the capacity building side. And this is also a part that I didn't talk about at all, which is the government response, misinformation, um, censorship through denial of attention, information overload. They're all going at movement capacities. Movements have acquired narrative capacity and governments have now figured out how to mess with that, right? How to do counter attention, counter protest. Um, so I, I just really want to do away with online protest because you still hear this. People say, go, don't do it online. Go do it in the real world. I'm like, you know, it's all real. The question is, what are you doing online and how? And what are you doing? Because there's no magic to the offline thing. You can march big marches, and it may not really get what you think. And focus on the underlying resource um, attention than the path is uh, taking. So I'm not going to do the government's part, because I this is my, um, like the government part is something that I uh, think deserves a lot of attention that is not suitable for one talk. Uh, but what you see governments and counter movements doing right now is increasingly looking at, like there was this initial way where they couldn't figure it out and there's a lot of these early sort of disruptive moments. What I think they've really figured out increasingly, Egypt, Turkey, China, maybe US, I don't know, I probably, not yet, right? But I mean, there's sort of this evolution of looking at movements as, do they signal some other capacity and threat to us and then Governments have now actively learned how to disrupt some of the capabilities that social movements have acquired. And I think the most important one here, also counter movements, uh, the most, or other movements, the most important one has been, um, if you think of censorship as the way it was in the 90s, 80s in Turkey, Little House on the Prayer, that obviously doesn't work anymore. But if you think of censorship, not as a speaker-focused theory, but a listener-focused theory, and see it as a denial of attention. 
So that you, or denial of credibility, which is where misinformation uh, comes in. And you know, it's an old te technique, but it really works well in the digital age. So you see the moving going for the capacities, and I kind of wrote the book to try to say, let's see if we can analyze the capacities, focus on them, and understand them, not as a plea to do anything the old kind of way, but as a plea to say, if this is what you're missing in your capacity building, what is the 21st century network version of collective decision-making capability, right? We're not going to go to the old way. We're not going to just give up our technology. Why? Because it empowers you in so many ways. But what are the weaknesses that are introduced by using digital tech to carry your you know, backpack? And you haven't really figured out how to deal with the thin atmosphere. And all of a sudden, you're above 8,000 feet, and it's serious, right? This is what happens to social movements. So that's kind of um, a synopsis of a bunch of things. And now you don't have to read the book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. There are a few things in the book that are not there. Uh, who's going to, are we going to moderate, or are we going to have? Oh, hi, thanks. Um, I'm Judy Parole. I live next door. Where's is this on? Yeah. I live next door. Uh, I, I used to teach about this stuff, and I found your book. I'm w looking forward to reading the book. Well, I'm looking forward to reading your book, but in the meantime, I think you overestimate the organizational capacities of the anti-war movement and the March on Washington. I was involved in both of those things, and it was a chaotic mess of different groups doing their own things. And what really counted was communications. We used to use phones and phone chains. It was slower. But I mean, back to the Federalist Papers, being able to communicate, it's where those libraries come in. We all ha always had libraries of pamphlets that the newspapers wouldn't publish the stuff. So it's a um, sure. transformation that I think you really got a good angle on. Thank you. Um. Hi, I'm Ian. I'm a student here. Um, it seems like most of your uh, analysis is based on sort of a transnational left-wing movements broadly construed, mm -hmm. but I think one of the interesting things we've seen over the past couple of years is a sort of transnational right-wing reactionary yes. movement. How do you think that this, do you think this analysis applies in the same yeah. way to the alt-right and... So uh, that's a great, great question. Um, so the book, I wrote the book mostly, well obviously, you know, my own research and what I know of uh, colors this. I have a little bit, especially about the Tea Party movement, which is one of the most successful movements in the U.S past 20, 30 years, gets overlooked because people, everybody knows the Koch brothers funded them. So people tend to think of it as just astroturf. It's not. It's a real movement with very different tendencies. Um, so that's one thing. In terms of the right-wing movements, the argument I do kind of make, but I don't sort of analyze them in depth the same way, is that they too, so the internet's not like your pony. It only works for you, right? One of the things it does is uh, allow people to find like-minded people, right? I have a lot of stories of, you know, you're an Egyptian dissident and your family doesn't want to talk politics and where do you go to find people? You go on Twitter, you find people. So this initial movement formation, homophily, like if there's anything you're interested in the world, there's an internet group for it and you can find it. Um, that has been great for the initial stages of movement formation, especially when you, the public sphere was somewhat close to you. And this is true for many left-wing movements. This was also true for, uh, in Europe, I think the sort of more than the alt-right, the European white sort of nationalist right-wing movement is more, it's both more powerful and more interesting in some ways. They, the public sphere was mostly close to them. Well, because, you know, they had World War II and Nazis and all of that. So there's a lot of strong hate speech laws. There's a lot of ways that outlaws Nazis. So what you start seeing them do is that they start using the same techniques that a left-wing movement does, uh, uses to push the public sphere, is that they organize online, they get enough numbers, they start propagating, they start finding like-minded people. And you start seeing like their numbers rise um, in all sorts of countries where they were basically negligent. And uh, you can argue this was a form of ignorance where a lot of people kind of harbored some sympathy 
but you didn't know if other people's private information was the same as yours in this revelation of preferences, which is something that's been studied heavily for movement formation, and I think internet is a big deal in that, and I talk about that a big in the book. So that happened to them too, with one difference. So the, the sort of movement formation, pushing the public sphere, creating a counter public, you got the same. Unlike the left, Fish movements there, uh, they are not ambivalent about power, right? Their whole political culture doesn't come from this analysis of power as a bad thing that we do not want to touch, which is sort of the left kind of inherently is. Uh, there's a book uh, by my friend, Jonathan Smucker, who goes into how the left movements so much are in that. And you see this a bit with the Tea Party, too. Since they don't have that kind of analysis of power, what you see them do in the European sphere is they're like, all right, what's the election where we have a shot? And you start seeing them run in the European Parliament, which is sort of easier to get to because it doesn't have the same national structures. So I would argue that a good chunk of some of the mechanisms I identify in my book that apply to left-wing movements, up like homophily, preference revelation, politics ignorance, um, attention, uh, they apply to them. Except since their political culture is different, they use it. In some ways, they use it to wield more power than by, almost by definition. You see their rise globally. And you see also in the Tea Party movement, which I did talk about in my book, the one thing that when people talk to them, they're like political scientists. They know the legislative arcane things in a way like a left-wing movement would see as corrupt and not knowing. So there's an instrumental side to them. And I think that's part of their disproportional um, impact in especially the United States with the, the, their caucus, they blocked President Obama's second term basically, arguably they have a president uh, elected. So that's kind of like the political, I, this is also why I don't think you can organize tech aside from the culture in which it's embedded, right? You, you have the mechanisms that feel similar things but the culture and the tech interact to create sort of, it starts to diverge. Okay. Hi, uh, Vivek Krishnamurthy, so I teach in the Cyberlock Clinic here. So I'm, I'm really interested in your diagnosis of technology purpa and the comparison between civil rights and modern movements and on the dimension of governance, right? So do you think there's something inherent about attention-grabbing technology or, or digital technology, to make it even more pointed, that prevents effective governance from okay. emerging? Or is there a technological solution to that right. problem? So Great question. Um, part of it is clearly the culture, the culture that's, resi I mean, you didn't need to have, the, it, I have long passages in my book about the assembly structure of the offline thing and what it led to. And that wasn't a technological problem. That was something that uh, merged with movement culture. But that said, um, the, the, these movements use the platforms they use because social movement people, they're going to go where the people are. Right, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook because they're going to go where the people are. But they've also started using them to organize, right? Because they're already there and uh, you don't have really too many alternative tools. The problem with the sort of, um, I'll give two examples. Like with, both, with Facebook, Facebook algorithm is nonpartisan in the left right spectrum, but it's partisan for pushing things that are either outrageous or very cute and cuddly. Right? We can go into long story why it's clearly picking up on human tendencies to be cognizant of threat and we like cute cuddly things because uh, that's how we you know, put up with kids, right? So basically there's these human tendencies and Facebook's algorithm feeds them because it's meant to, the whole thing is optimized to get you to spend more time on this site. That means for a social movement, that those are your options. And if you look at the post-election sort of left social media, it's pushing to the edge and edge edge. It's sort of you started this uh, rise of conspiracy left. It's getting bigger and bigger. There's a lot of the, uh, the stuff that are non-factual. All the things that you know we're talking about, you're seeing it because it's it goes viral very easily. It's also a way to make money. So you it's pushing the movement in a particular way. Twitter. Because it has retweets and likes as the only two mechanisms, right? What gets retweets a lot of time, and it's very public. So what happens there is that if there's an argument between people, 
let me merge the culture thing. Because the culture is leaderless, right? You have the emergence of de facto spokespeople. There's no formal leadership. But the people with high social media following become de facto spokespeople because that's who the media goes to. They have the megaphone. So the other people in the movement get frustrated. They're like, who made you the leader? And they want, or they want to argue with this person, say, let's do this, let's not do that. Since there's no formal mechanism, the only way you can do it is to go, you know, bicker with them. And that is an attention-grabbing thing, because it's kind of like watching a wreck. Like, everybody turns and looks. And because the retweet mechanism is the only mechanism you have, you have no mechanism that is trying to say, how do we bring this to a conclusion, right? All you have is lots of people retweeting arguments and the burns and all the things. And worse for the movement, it's publicly available in screenshots and all of this for a long, long time. This may seem like a minor problem, but internal strife has been incredibly destructive to pretty much all the moments I discuss. I mean, it is not this minor annoyance. It is something that has paralyzed movements just as the government's coming for them. So the, the fact that why does Twitter do this? Why does Facebook do this? It makes perfect sense for their business model. It makes no sense for a movement to do its decision making this way. So could you have, there's a couple of tools. There's Lumio that tries to do that. It's running out of funding. People use Reddit because even though Reddit is Reddit, it's better. It doesn't have these algorithmic attention structures. Uh, that. So I think there's a great need to bring it together for collective decision making tools that respect the movement cultural sensibilities. You're not going to get people just to vote up and down. These are participatory movements. You're, you're not going to tell people, get in line. It's not, none of that is going to work. So if there were a way that collective decision making could take place, so the participatory sensibilities were recognized and respected, but also brought to a conclusion through a transparent and legitimate way, so that the only way to argue for a different path wasn't to bicker among yourselves on Twitter. I think that would be an enormous positive thing to many, many social movements, because that's their big weakness. Uh, the culture would have to come along too. And I think after all these defeats, I think the sort of movements have kind of been like, OK, we do need to do this a little bit. This is our last question. Oh, oh hi. Um, so there are a couple of things that I was thinking about. One was the emergence of leadership, as with the medical supplies, mm -hmm. and how this kind of arises in a way that is totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. So you know that that to me is a very strong kind of upside in terms of you know there are possibilities. The other thing I was thinking about was the moments of change, right? And this just ties in with your concept of attention. And the one that always springs to mind with what we have at the moment in the US is the Anita Hill hearings mm -hmm. and the way that galvanized the women to run for office. I mean, after watching the hearings. So, you know, the, the, that concept of attention, I think, is absolutely perfect because if you can get right. if you can get a large community focused on where it is you're looking to go you know what mm -hmm. the next steps are i think that 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 can really um well, make it happen well, i'll give you an example to explain how significant how this moves and it's an example from china uh based on a paper that was published by gary king and jennifer penn and gary king is actually here it's an amazing so it's, it's an amazing series of papers. So everybody knows China has a 50 cent army kind of thing. If you haven't heard of it, it's call it what you want. They're, they, people call them trolls. Russia has them. Like their people, the government, allegedly pays 50 cents per post. And for a long time, there was this question, what do these people do? Right? Like what does the 50 there, there are these apparently hundreds of thousands of people who are paid to post online. But well, what the heck do they post and what do they do? So they did this really ingenious study, downloaded tons of things. They looked at what got censored. So they kept taking snapshots, because the Chinese government censors a lot of things. 
But it's not this closed public sphere, right? There's hundreds of millions of people on their own version of Twitter, their own... It's not really, like, you can't censor everything, so you're choosing what to censor, and you've got this very lively public sphere. So what do they censor? What do these 50 cent people do? So here's the finding. Unlike... You'd think they'd be censoring all government criticism. They don't. In fact, if anything, my sense is they use it like a petition to the emperor. You kind of get a read of where things are. Government criticism is not really censored. They do censor calls to collective action because that's the threat to them. So they want to get participation and feedback from the population just as long as don't touch our power. Because otherwise you're blind to where your problems are, right? Because authoritarian regimes, they fall because they can't measure the population and the weaknesses. So that's kind of, okay, that's interesting. They don't censor uh, criticism. Here's the thing that I found really fascinating. And I, I swear, I, I gave a talk at BuzzFeed the other day, and I was like, Chinese Communist Party, BuzzFeed, two institutions that really understand attention. Um, and I'll explain, you know, because you think of them as the sort of Chinese Communist Party, they must be crusty, boring. No, no, no. Here's what they do. These people do not go and argue with government critics. You think they go and, you know, when you say something, they don't. They don't go and um, post pro-government stuff. I mean, they don't turn it into Pravda, right? You know, a pro-government sort of parroting doesn't work. You see it, people roll their eyes, right? They don't do that. Here's what they do. When there's an event here of some importance, some anniversary, something that is of politically fraught, the 50 cent people go over here and they go, oh look, there's some other totally different thing and they just create this huge distraction. They literally create a huge distraction, whatever it may be, you know, a scandal and blah and royal mayor, I don't care, like they find something because the thing, the current mode of censorship isn't blocking attention, it's blocking the connection between, I'm blocking information, it's, it's blocking the attention to the information. That's very effective. And I thought, this is just mind-blowingly, I'm not happy about it, but it's kind of really impressive how good they are in understanding. In the Hong Kong protests, they pulled back the police and the tear gas and pepper spray because that gets you Anita Hill, right? That gets you the visuals, that gets you these pictures that are so grabbing. Instead, they're like, we are going to wait as quietly as possible till they get kind of, they hit that their tactical freeze. And it worked. So that's kind of the last question. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Sainab. Thank you for being here. Thank you and have a good afternoon.